Hello, friends of RGD and the internet. You are watching the fourth in the Freshly Certified Webinar Series, and we're talking about wayfinding and experiential design today. My name is not Amanda Bolte, who is our resident host of the series. Unfortunately, she has had a schedule conflict today, so I will be subbing in. Uh, my name is Victor Cito, and I'm the Creative Director at Green Living Enterprises in Toronto, and I also volunteer at RGD as the board member and uh, chair of the certification committee. Um, as a viewer, if you have any questions about this presentation or for our pre presenters today, please use the question tab in the control panel and we will hold a Q&A when the panelists are finished. To give everyone a breakdown of this webinar, we're going to talk about our GD certification process with a focus on case study development and presentations. Our panel of four recently certified RGD members work in the fascinating design stream of wayfinding and experiential design. And they're going to talk about one of the case studies, why they chose it, the process of putting it together, gathering the assets, and how they went about presenting it. But first, a little bit about RGD and our overall certification process. Um, let me give you a quick introduction. So. So our RGD members are a community of more than 4,000 like-minded professionals, including firm owners, freelancers, managers, educators, and students with access to professional development, resources, and a vibrant exchange of resources um, and information. Through RGD, designers exchange ideas, educate and inspire, set professional standards, and build a strong supportive community dedicated to advocating the value of design for more information about RGD and the resources available for members and the design community, visit rgd.ca. So, so today we're talking about becoming a certified RGD, which can be broken down into four easy steps. Number one, filling out the application form to determine your eligibility. Number two, take an open book, multiple choice, 80 minute online test. Number three, present six pieces of your work virtually to three senior practitioners over 30 minutes. And number four, and probably the easiest step, receive your results and join RGD. So the focus of, sorry, the focus of this webinar is, in my opinion, the fun part, which deals with designers talking about their work and doing the virtual portfolio presentation. This is where designers get to talk about being a designer and portfolios are presented virtually uh, within a 30 minute period to three senior design practitioners serving as RGD reviewers. Candidates present six of their best pieces from their application. And during the review, you're asked to talk about your six case studies in the 30 minutes while you're talking in depth about one of them. So we have a diverse panel of wayfinding and experiential designers from Canada and the US today. Um, our first panelist, her name is Rena Alfonso. Um, so if I can get Rena on our screen while I talk about her. Um, Rena is the founder and creative director of Studio Aorta, um, a certified small women and minority owned design agency in Washington DC, USA, uh, that specializes in exhibit and graphic design. She's also part time senior lecturer at the MFA. Uh, sorry about that. She's also part time senior lecturer in the MFA museum exhibit planning and design program at the University of the Arts Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and serves on the steering committee of the American Alliance of Museums Independent Museum Professionals Network. She'll be presenting a project called Home Brewed, an exhibit at the Hyrick House Museum in Washington, DC, that uses the lens of history to examine local Washington, DC culture during the height of prominence of the Christian Hyrick Brewing Company from the mid 19th to early 20th century. Um, do I have Rena here? I muted. Hello. Can you all see me? Oh, there. Like, there we are. The, the... Hi, Rena. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hi, everyone. Great. Thanks for joining the webinar today, and uh, I'll let you take it away. Awesome. Hello, everybody. My name is Rina Alfonso, RGD. Um, I was recently certified just in the last maybe month or so. Um, of, and I'm excited to be here to talk to you about my project and my case study. So a little bit about myself. Um, I went, I didn't go to school for um, design until I was in graduate school. I always thought I'd be more of an academic slash um, curator, but I was always into museums and had a creative side to be. And, I ended up being in 
um, exhibition design or ended up in the path of exhibition design, which sort of uh, merges all my interests in design and history and narratives in, in, in spaces. So the, the, the project I'm going to talk to you about is called Homebrewed, as Victor introduced, which is a um, small exhibit in a historic house museum here in DC. Um, I chose this case study because um, not only is it one of my favorite projects, it is the project that I think best articulates how I was able to help guide the entire museum staff through the exhibition planning and design process as they'd never worked with a designer before. So through that whole process, we really started from discovery and development and finding um, appropriate content to put in the exhibit because it was going to be semi-permanent. And we really had a co-creative, like co-creation or co-creative approach, very collaborative and with the museum, the entire museum staff and curator. And since it's a house museum, it's a really small staff that they have over there. So we started with the conceptual um, design phase and the discovery phase. As you can see, this is um, on the left. These are some of the photos from our workshops as we were discussing content and, and planning out what this exhibit could be. So the right is that image. This was the space. Um, they had actually done a great job in sort of prepping one of their uh, like adjacent galleries. It's not in the main historic house, which has all of the like beautiful, fancy woodwork and sort of staged rooms, but they had intended this place to be more of like an event space and programming space, but wanted something that could be flexible with for um, events, but also host um, an exhibit that represented some of the museum's collection. So through this discovery and conceptual design phase, um, since my background you know, is in exhibit design, we started really with narrative and um, interpretive planning, which also involved mapping out stories within like the floor plan of the gallery. And I also did a site visit and survey with studies of how um, you know, there, there could be built elements to fit into the space and to house the object. From that conceptual design place phase, we moved into a floor plan, like a formal floor plan and, and sort of visitor flow planning. So this is the floor plan that we landed on. And then we went through iterations for graphic hierarchy. Because there was limited wall space um, and we wanted the wall space to, to really be taken up more by objects uh, mounted to the wall, they have these beautiful like large windows that also let in a lot of natural light and that was problematic because a lot of their artifacts are paper. So one of the solutions that we did come up with um, are using graphic panels to cover some of the windows which were double-sided so you would have presence of the museum on the outside um, before people enter the gallery but at the same time that freed up wall space in order to get more objects on the wall. The um, uh, we there there was limited opportunities to have really big built elements since the gallery was small and as I mentioned they wanted to have it also double as an event and programming space so we had to be really sort of unique um, or sort of uh, flexible with how we dis uh, with how we um, designed the the extra panels and how that fit into the architecture of the space. These are some of the iterations of the graphic hierarchy and intro panels that we came up with. And this is a final hierarchy um, of graphic panels and uh, exhibition graphics that are in the museum today. The main inspiration was from the um, brewery ephemera um, from the artifacts. And also, um, if you see here on the left, uh, if I hope everybody can see my cursor. The three stars with the double bars, that's the flag of Washington, DC. So we wanted it to really feel like, um, you know, part of local, lo local culture, but also have that cool, um, you know, graphic feeling as if you were uh, surrounded by um, brewery and um, graphics that you would see maybe in a brewery or, um, more, uh, I don't know, contemporary space uh, and not really a house museum. So as you can see, this is what the exhibit ended up looking like. 
um, on the bottom here, you have uh, the uh, elevation drawing that I that I did before um, in order to determine where the panels and objects would go um, and to make sure that the graphics would be able to be installed properly in the space. This is the intro panel. We had to eventually angle it um, just because of uh, historic house uh, constraints that sometimes the measurements um, aren't necessarily so accurate as you're like planning and, and moving through. Uh, we did verify them though, um, but that worked out well because that actually ended up being like a funnel, but it really sort of moved people through the space as they entered. Um, part of the features of the exhibit was a movable timeline um, central column, which was triple sided, as you can see here. This is a flat graphic version, which has a timeline of the brewery history, the founder, a little bit about the founder, and also a little bit about the person where the bulk of the collection came from. Um, this is the end part of the gallery where you would see some of the um, Again, uh, ephemera from the brewery and its heyday. There's also a uh, mural, a wall mural that, a graphic mural that talks about um, the tragic uh, burning down of the of the of the of the brewery before um, it was eventually um, sold back to the federal government in BC in the early 20th century. So after the exhibit was installed, um, the museum actually used it quite a bit and there, they noticed that there was an increase in attendance um, thanks to this multifunctional space that you know they could use it for specific exhibition tours but then also um, they, they would host events and they would also um, let people host events in their space. So with that there was a lot of you know sort of the, the, the museum and how they were sort of moving forward there's a long history um, as to how um, you know the museum came about, obviously, but I won't get into that right now. Um, and it just moved them in the correct direction, which they're still going through today. Um, after this exhibit, they also started to plan a shift in their narrative, thanks to this visitor-centered approach that I introduced to them and also um, worked through with them. Um, so it's really interesting to see also how their narrative and storytelling um, has evolved. And consequently, it's really cool because now um, our studio, although I'm not there right now um, because of some internet issues, um, is above this exhibit. So we get to see it um, quite a bit and, and notice and see how people react in the space. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I look forward to answering any questions at the end of the webinar and look also look forward to seeing the other presenters. Thanks so much, Rina. Um, thanks for sharing your story too. I didn't know you didn't come from a traditional design education background. So it's, I think it's gonna be inspiring to people who might have a similar experience as you. So thanks so much. So our second presenter is uh, Brian Banton. Um, he is a multidisciplinary designer originally from Toronto, Canada. Uh, Brian's worked as a senior designer at Pentagram's New York City office. Um, a, a principal designer at Frog Design's Brooklyn office, and as a visual designer for Oculus VR at Facebook Reality Labs in Menlo Park, California. After completing a master's degree in design in Toronto, Brian designed award-winning books, identity systems, and motion graphics for cultural and nonprofit institutions before heading to New York City. Uh, Brian has worked with an array of clients, small and large, in the commercial and nonprofit space, leveraging design, strategy, and technology to create scalable, human-centered, and delightful experiences. Uh, Brian will be talking about the exhibit called Music to Your Eyes, in which he was commissioned to create a visual reality experience that could bring uh, gallery visitors even deeper into their fantastical world. And the project provides a small glimpse into what experiences virtual reality can unlock for experiential design. Uh, Brian, I know you're having some connection issues so thank you for showing your webcam but you might uh, be offline and just show your presentation which is totally fine but uh, the floor is yours okay can, i just want to make sure you can hear me yeah we can hear you can you hear me sorry okay and you see my screen now yeah and we can see your screen yeah 
Okay, cool. Um, all right, so I'm going to go in. That was a lovely, lovely introduction, so I'm not going to talk about myself. I'll just talk about the project. Um, and as as he alluded to, this project more speaks, I think, to the future possibilities of experiential design. It's um, it's not like strictly an experiential design project, I guess, tr a traditional one. Um, but um, I'll just go. I'll go along. <laughs> um, so this project was commissioned by design duo Wade and Lita, who are a New York-based couple who do a lot of playful design, um, a lot of like kind of like graphic colors and shapes, and they do a lot of commercial work. But this project was actually a project that they were doing for an exhibition in Japan, and so they were creating this exhibition that was full of like vibrant shapes and colors that wanted, they just want to provide gallery visitors with an experience of like, kind of wow and overwhelming, yes. And so they commissioned me. So my my partner was working with Wade and Lita on like a separate project and they knew that I did VR. So they thought like, oh, maybe it'd be cool to create a VR experience for the exhibition that would kind of bring gallery visitors like even deeper into, um, they're in a fantastical world. And so what they did was like, we, we kind of jammed on an idea, like what can we do to um, kind of make their experience virtual? And we landed this idea of making like a full 360 3D video that would be experienced in a virtual reality headset um, by user, by people who go to the gallery. And, and to provide some context of like what I was doing at the time, I was working at at Facebook at the time, um, doing um, working on the Oculus VR platform, and at that time I was super like kind of pixel density and ergonomics and like information architecture. We had just launched the first quest, and we were working on the second quest. And we were trying to translate like how can we make sure that like the UI can like handle higher resolution and that the headset has like enough compute to like render the images that we want to do. So it was very much about like utilitarian design stuff. And and this project for me was like, it was like an opportunity to step away from that and do something that's like very delightful and like just like not about like technical stuff at all. So this th these projects are kind of like not the normal projects that you would do for work, but I thought it was like an amazing opportunity. And like typically when I've applied for jobs, um, these are the kind of projects like these kind of personal like really playful projects are the ones that get employers really excited and that's part of the reason why i included in my rgd application because it's it doesn't speak to all like the technical things that you would do as a designer but it kind of shows like what i'm passionate about and what i'm super interested in right this is and so i spent um, my christmas holiday that year um Hey Ryan, um, we're just getting Hello? some feedback from the audience that they can't see your screen. Do you want to um, just maybe check one more time? Oh, there we go. Uh, I mean, I'm sure. Is it there? Yes, we can see um, the slide that says "Music to Your Eyes" and then a description. Okay. Okay. So now I'm go I'm going to move ahead to the next slide. Can you see a slide with some photographs on it? Not yet. But uh, I'll let you know when we do. Do you want to scroll through um, back and forth just to prompt it? Yeah, I'm scrolling through. It might be my internet connection. Oh. Um, I can. It might be a bit delayed because um, we saw your full screen desktop for a moment, and then and then this came up. So I'll let you continue, um, and I guess we'll let your internet catch up. <laughs> well, the images speak for. I don't even have to talk if I show the images. So can you see? What can you see on my screen at the moment? Um, on the top half, it says music to your eyes, um, some graphics with like silhouettes. And... It's really delayed. I, I, changed... I want to stop sharing my screen and then like share it again. Okay.
Sorry about that, viewers. Uh, we'll be right back. There we go. Can you see my screen now? We see a lot of uh, colorful graphics in somebody in a VR headset. Okay, so this is the um, this is the physical gallery space, and that's I think if you're seeing the same slide I am, that's Wade and Lita in the up in the upper left picture, and, and Lita wearing the headset on the right side. And so you can get an idea of what the space is like and what the visuals look like. And the, the neat thing about having a VR experience is that you're not always limited to like the kind of physical restraints of reality. So um, the actual gallery space was like, I don't know, maybe 100 feet by 100 feet or, or something. You could fit like maybe 30, 40 people in there at a time. And then here are some more images of people in the gallery space and in the VR headset. Um, but in VR, you can make, you, can, you have like infinite space to work with. So one of the things that we did, we decided to do with the VR space is make the scale ginormous, like really giant compared to what the physical space was. And I hope you can see the slide. This is like a, 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 a rendering now. You should be seeing not photographs anymore. Um, and so just to give you a sense of the scale, this is like what a person, um, the size of a person relative to the world that they would be in, in the VR headset. And then zooming out a little bit, and then zooming out more, you can't even see the person anymore. They're like super tiny. Um, right, right. I think your screen stopped the center sharing. There somewhere. Um, and then this is like, it stopped sharing again. Yeah. Like we can't see your screen at all right now. Oh, you can't see my screen at all. So on my side, it shows that I'm showing my main screen. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure what the problem is. Let me try making you a presenter one more again. Maybe if you skip mine, I'm. I might... Let me try over time making you the presenter. Do we want to come back to Brian? Um, and. Yeah, I'm yeah, gonna try switching that. computers and see if that helps. Yeah, okay. let's give let's yeah, give Brian I'll uh, come back later. Yeah, a little break. Um, we'll move on to the uh, next presenter, um, who is Ross Chandler. Um, so Ross is a 15-year veteran of the graphic design industry and founder, creator, director of the brand design studio, uh, becoming Design Office. He's a graduate of OCAD U, where uh, he won the school medal for editorial design and went to work at a leading creative uh, or went to work at leading creative studios in Toronto, Vancouver, and Tokyo before settling in v Victoria, BC. Um, his approach to design is process based, strategic, and often relies heavily on typography, which he believes is the cornerstone of applied design. Uh, the case study he'll be presenting is for a permanent public art installation for the high street of University. Uh, Simon Fraser University's Burnaby Mountain Campus, and the project required his team to develop content and graphics to match the future primitive shape and mood structures. Ross, please walk through the viewers through this project and how you put the case study together. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, actually, um, similar to uh, to Brian, uh, who I, I hope we can get back up and running because I'm really, really keen to see that project, Brian. Um, but uh, yeah, this this project is one that was a little bit unusual um, for for me, obviously, because uh, it, it was a little bit outside of the typical applied design. Uh, work that we normally do at the studio. Uh, we typically focus a lot on brand design, packaging, um, you know, communication design, that kind of stuff. And so along came an opportunity from um, this. So I should back up and let you know that this project came about uh, through one of my office mates when I was sharing office space in Vancouver, uh, BC. Uh, I was sharing office space with a bunch of architects, one of which was Matthew Souls, uh, who is um, uh, alumni at the uh, UBC Salad program and uh, does lots of uh, really interesting projects, including the 
uh, Vancouver Art Gallery, uh, Front Courtyard, and uh, lots of lots of cool stuff. So anyway, he was commissioned to um, do a, pub, a, a permanent installation that ran up along High Street, uh, Victor, as you said, um, that uh, basically ran in front of residential, three, three blocks of residential. And what he came up with was this future primitive um, uh, uh, response, I guess, that uh, um, I'll show you in a minute here, and um, uh, was was uh, was an interesting series of forms. Basically, he really wanted to collaborate uh, with someone that could bring a uh, graphic uh, aspect to that. So, um, really interesting opportunity to be collaborative, uh, work in a space that is a little bit more free than typical applied design, and uh, um, and yeah. So, uh, I guess without further ado, I'll dive in. Um, this is what the project looks like uh, on the left. Uh, I think in total there were 50 units. Uh, so on the left, you can see um, uh, the installation there working in all of its glory, being utilized by somebody, possibly a student, although it does look relatively staged. Uh, on the right hand side, um, I hesitated to use this image on the right actually because it was, um, it, it is what I, what I feel is kind of like a quintessential sort of architect image. Um, love architects still share office space with them now, but uh, I always feel like you can kind of tell that that person walking up the path has been placed in there um, after the fact. So, um, but it does do a good job of showing um, how the project was integrated um, into, uh, it, into the landscape there. Um, yeah, so, so getting back to uh, the original scope of the project, um, uh, another thing that really captivated me about this project was that it was an opportunity for sort of good old fashioned uh, interaction. Um, the, uh, the structures are meant to work in a bunch of different ways and the graphics played an integral role in that. So um, obviously the first way people are meant to interact with it is visually. Um, obviously they're very interesting visual um, structures. Um, and I know that they, the, the, the sort of seed idea that, that created you from Matthew, the architect, was that they were sort of the perfect combination of the human landscape, um, built landscape, and the natural landscape. And that's why you can see in the uh, example in front of us here, there was, um, or there is, uh, you know, some, some flora and fauna growing out of the top. Um, and so we really wanted to create content that was going to um, complement that idea. Uh, so visual interaction, obviously the second level of interaction would be actually using the, 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 uh, the um, structures. So, you know, they were designed to be sat on. Um, you can see on the right hand side up by the, uh, the woman walking up the walk there, that there's some little cubbies that were left inside uh, for people to leave little, you know, um, Easter eggs or what, what have you not for, uh, for people um, that lived uh, in that neighborhood. Um, so, uh, working with Matthew and his team, um, we worked really closely with them as far as um, what kind of content to put in. Um, we wanted to tell a story that um, uh, focused on, uh, I guess, like the history, uh, what life would be like uh, at Simon Fraser University, and also what life would be like for the local residents there. So, um, we dug into the history books, we spoke to local residents, and came up with um, these kind of diatribes, uh, some of which were kind of long, some of which were just single words, and put together really what we thought was an interesting content mix that kind of just like spoke to um, life, past, present, and future um, in, in the neighborhood. And uh, to add a little bit of visual interest and also to sort of harken back to Matthew's desire to have this future primitive um, aspect, uh, we kind of, you know, thought about, okay, Rosetta Stone, you know, the three different levels of language. Um, what if we came up with an alphabet based on iconography? So we decided to go with an icon level, um, just Roman characters and then uh, Braille. Um, and that actually gave us a lot of um, interesting um, content to play with visually because we were able to hide messages. We were able to make structures a bit more accessible um, and, um, and really just sort of play and, and make it more visually interesting. So uh, you can see on the right, sort of a zoomed in image of the, um, uh, of the messaging cast into um, the, it's the ductile concrete. Uh, so it's really, really like reinforced, super strong content, that can, or con concrete rather, 
they can be um, it can be made very very thin and very very strong. Um, yeah, and then on the left you can see the twenty six character set. Um, uh, yeah, but it was really just meant to be super duper random. Um, we wanted to focus on you know the, obviously the three different levels you know natural, human, and um, and built landscapes. But we also wanted to think about you know what's what's what are some sort of quirky everyday student type things like basketballs and you know beakers from the science lab. Um, wanted to share with you guys uh, a little bit about the process of putting this together and how the collaboration went. Um, as Victor pointed out, um, love typography, OS have, and uh, so of course one of the most urgent things that I wanted to figure out when I was putting this project together was how are we going to have a consistent baseline for all the typography that we run through this thing as it runs around all the crazy angles. Um, uh, Actually, if you look at the image on the left right here, hopefully everyone can see my slide. Um, that structure that seems to be sort of hanging to the right of the bench is actually cantilevered, and that's like a little bit of a, uh, a good example of how strong this, um, this concrete can be. Uh, but anyway, we ended up working with the architecture team to build um, wireframes, basically, and then um, we uh, ran the type through all these. Um, we, we actually ended up um, adjusting the setting a little bit and creating a center line to run the text through. Um, and that gave us an opportunity to really um, go in and, um, and, and set things up the way we wanted them to and test drive them as much as we could in the structures. Um, this is kind of a zoomed in so you can, you can see um, how everything's uh, coming together. Obviously, um, fine details of typography like kerning uh, were extremely challenging uh, when trying to make it readable. Um, in the bottom right hand side, I don't know if you can see it, um, there is a little bit of a legend that we put in and sort of hid um, that um, demystifies the, uh, the 26 character set of icon icons that we built. And uh, this was an effort to um, just add a little bit of fun and, uh, and interest for local residents, you know, maybe kids or, or people who love to decode, uh, you know, puzzles and stuff like that could sort of, you know, have fun and uh, interact even in an even more uh, sort of in-depth way with, uh, with the structures and the messaging. And we did this for, um, for all of the, uh, all the forms. So I'm not gonna show them all to you, but um, this is kind of another, another integral process part that I wanna share, which is on the right, we basically had uh, this overlay that just had everything set in like standard font so that we knew at all times we could have the copy editor check everything and make sure that you know we hadn't misspelled anything um, in any of the different um, character styles that we were using. Um, another uh, detail here, I guess maybe one of the underlying sort of um, uh, uh, points of this, this this whole presentation is just talking about how to present work, and I think that um, you know it's really really vital when you're presenting work to try and um, provide context or a little bit of, of story. Um, you know, uh, as, as young designers, I could even include process work. I haven't done that really here, but more of showing the process of the project. So um, the structures were actually built by a company here on Vancouver Island uh, that holds the local patent on ductile concrete. And so this is, these are some slides uh, just showing the process of building each structure. So each one was actually built um, out of a um, uh, like moldable wood, basically glued together, and then um, uh, they lay this uh, this fabric that was CNC cut um, over top of all the structures. And this lovely guy's job was to pull the counters and the periods and all the infill out of all the characters on every single structure um, before these were set into a reverse casting casting system to create the um, uh, to create the structures. And uh, yeah, this is uh, my final slide about the project. Um, I think there was about 50, 50 uh, individual um, stations that were set up along the high street. And uh, yeah, a little shot on the left there of how, you know, some of the local residents were starting to place, you know, toys and, and random things in there. So um, yeah, I hope uh, this is an insight insightful presentation. And um, yeah, I think that's all I can say about it. Thank you, Ross. Um, yeah, I love all the layers to the project and the fact that you showed the visuals 
um, and how they illustrate the details, the complexity of how you put it together. Like that was uh, really, really interesting and insightful. So thanks very much. Um, I think Brian is still trying to get back in. So we're gonna um, have Lindsay come up um, and she's gonna talk about her presentation so that we can give Brian some time to uh, get his set up. Um, Lindsay is an in-house graphic designer for Silver Star Mountain Resort in Vernon, BC, uh, which is a year-round tourist destination. As an in-house designer, she provides design solutions across all business units within the resort. Um, she's worked in a variety of design roles over the past eight years of her career, from working with clients in retail, cosmetics, automotive, and most recently in the ski and bike industry, uh, she showcases a high level of adaptability and brings an extensive background of design knowledge to all of her projects. Lindsay is a graduate of the graphic design program at Fancha College, and she's going to talk about Seismic, a collaboration of the ski and bike industries, bringing together sport, business, art, culture, culinary, and community into a 10-day mountain festival. Take it away, Lindsay. Thanks, Victor, and thanks for having me. Um, I'll just bring up my presentation here. All right. So as Victor mentioned, I am an in-house graphic designer for Silver Star Mountain Resort here in uh, Vernon, BC. Um, so Silver Star is a ski resort in the winter and it's a bike park in the summer. Um, and I recently received my RGD certification this past, past March, so newly certified. Um, so in my current role, I work with a small marketing team of four people and together we not only support the resort as a whole, but we also, uh, support the different business units affiliated with the resort. So that includes several restaurants, accommodation, there's a spa, and we have several resort services. Um, so the project I'm presenting today is a festival Silver Star held in the month of March 2019 called Seismic Spring Mountain Festival. And we were about to head into our second year running in March 2020, but unfortunately it was put to a stop the first day of the festival due to the pandemic. Um, so I chose this case study for a couple of reasons. Number one was I had a lot of creative freedom in terms of the design. There wasn't many parameters that I had to follow as this was the first time the resort was holding a festival of this size. And so the sky was the limit in terms of the branding, which doesn't usually happen for a designer. So for me, that was pretty exciting that I, I had that freedom. Um, number two was being that I enjoy snowboarding outside of work, I was passionate about this industry. And for me, I think when you're passionate about something, you, it's easier to talk about. So I really had a connection with this project. Um, and number three was, it was probably the biggest project I've worked on to date. And uh, there were several moving parts to it, which challenged me as, me as a designer. Um, there was a lot of people involved in organizing from different department heads to the events team, to brand partners. So overall, it was pretty exciting to see how that all came together in the end. And my process on how I put this case study together was really backtracking to the beginning of where it all started and how it evolved over time. So really organizing my thought process and actually putting it to paper, which I don't always do in all my projects. So it was kind of backtracking and organizing all those thoughts. So here's just a few photos to give you an idea of what Silver Star looks like. Um, so it's a very colorful village. It's the third largest ski resort in BC. Um, so here's just some photos to give you an idea of that. Some key objectives for this project was they wanted to drive resort visitation in overnight stays, as historically in the past, the month of March had very low numbers in these areas. Um, number two is we wanted to get people registered for the events, especially the seven main sporting events, as these had high cash pricing involved. We also wanted to gain more of a following on social media and drive more website, pro website traffic. And then the festival should also have a tie into Silver Star Mountain Resort, but be its own brand by itself. And then lastly, we, they wanted a brand that's something that would not only appeal to the athletes participating in the sporting events, but a brand that would appeal to people of all ages as there were several sort of secondary events. So we had a comedy show, there was kid events, um, a lot of uh, dinners, uh, and like an art exhibit, different community events, etc. So in terms of designing the logo, 
um, for the festival, I wanted to bring elements that related to the main sporting events, but in a more subtle way. So since the main sporting events were to be held in the train park on both skis and snowboard, I started noticing a similar shape that connected all these elements. So as you can see here, um, you, this is showing like the tips of the skis, the snowboards, it's showing the smooth rounded figure, um, the ski tracks in the top left corner, all these sort of shapes started to have a similarity to them. So here's what the final logo looked like. Um, so two challenges that I faced with this project was it was a very short time frame in terms of getting everything out and there was a lack of information on confirmed events. So the festival actually started out a lot smaller than it ended up being. As time went on more events were being added and so there was a lot of last minute preparation. Um, so I needed to create a brand that had some flexibility to it but had some key elements that were cemented to keep the brand consistent. So two ways I looked at doing this was creating a multicolor palette of colors, as well as a palette of patterns. So as you can see here on the left-hand side, um, this is Silver Star's current color palette. So it's already very colorful. So I wanted to kind of keep with that theme, but bring in more of um, pastel-y colors as we were heading into spring. Um, so picking some of these colors on the right, um, like lighter pinks, pastel-y blues, um, so yeah, bringing in those types of colors. These were the final colors that we went with in the font. Um, so again, these bright pastel colors to evoke feelings of cheerfulness, excitement, and kind of gives the viewer an uplifting feeling as we just came out of a really long, dark winter. And then to pair with the colors, I also introduced a series of patterns and shapes that would represent each type of event within the festival. So both the colors and the shapes had a bit of flexibility. So if more events were being added, we could add to this collection. And I found that this design solution became beneficial as events were being added days before the event, before the festival started. So here's what the final branding looked like. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of different colors involved, but there's some key elements that were cemented. So like the footer at the bottom, the web URL, um, the top headers, they all look similar. And again, the fonts as well. Here was the billboard that we did that was up. And then here was some of the, uh, one of the biggest challenges was trying to present this information to the viewer in a way that they would understand. So we're using those colors we broke up each day and then highlighting the key events. So this was a stand that was in the middle of the village. So as people came in, they could see what was going on for the day. We also mimicked that into the local paper. So the community knew what was coming up, what to look for. And then just showing some of the merchandise as well. So we had some t-shirts and hoodies, hats. Oops. And then also was some ski buffs that we designed. Um, so these were some of the, some of the merchandise we gave out to some of the guests. Again, bringing that, those same um, colors into, uh, we worked with a local ski company and created custom skis, and these were part of the prizing for the sporting events. And then these were some of the posters that were up in resort as well as in town, showcasing the seven main sporting events, showing the cash prizing, so again, keeping those footers similar, but again, the colors were very flexible in the patterns as well. Here's some more of those secondary events. So the comedy shows, some dinners, we had a lot of uh, musical acts, film nights. And then showing some of the sporting events. So we had um, some giant custom checks made Again, bringing in all those shapes that match the posters, the shapes that were on the posters. And again, just some more photos from the festival. Um, so overall, we had amazing feedback from staff and local community on the branding. And we saw that in um, guests buying the merchandise. Um, and then some more the key stats that we measured was, we were 20% increase in our overnight stays. 
Uh, we were at 94 occupancy over all 10 days, which was up from 74% the previous year. We had an increase in international guest visitation. We had an increase in attendees and spectators. Um, we were 28,000 from year one and went up to 32,500 for year two. Our ad click-throughs to our branded web content was up 79% from the previous year. And we were up 110% in impressions in our core markets in paid digital. And then with the success of this festival, we're now in the works of creating a summer festival, which is more bike related, but um, a lot of our key ski and bike brands are, are on board. So that's great. And that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Lindsay. Um, I really appreciate how you explained why you chose the case studies at the beginning. Um, and along with the inspirational images that you use to um, create the process of all of the um, design work together. So it gave us some insight as how you thought or how you think as a designer. So uh, mm -hmm. very much appreciated. Thank you. So, yeah. All right. So we're going to try to get Brian back on. Um, so let's see. Brian, are you here? Are you able to log in? Um, Sorry, but to give him a second, he's, he's coming back on right now. Sure thing. So, um, so we're just going to wait a couple minutes. Brian, we can see your screen at least. Sweet. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm sorry about all the technical <laughs> difficulties. So you can hear me and you can see my screen now. Yes, and I'm going to go off view and I'll just stay unmuted until, oh, there we go. Cool. Sorry, like my computer didn't work. My notes disappeared. I was a disaster. So I'm just going to go quickly through the first part again. Um, just for some context, I was doing super technical work at Oculus VR at Facebook. I wanted something to, I wanted to do something like fun and delightful. I find it like really fulfilling, you know, to balance like doing like very technical work with work that's more like um, passion work. So when Wade and Lita reached out to me and asked me to do a VR version of their exhibition, I was super excited. We got together, we jammed. Um, even though it was a personal project, we still kind of thought about it in terms of like, what are we trying to achieve? What's the goal? What do we want the user to experience? And because it was like a fun project, we thought of like the, just the idea of like bliss or joy. It was like, that's all we wanted the users to walk away with. So they had um, their physical exhibition, which I mentioned earlier was in like a physical space, which is like limited by like, you know, real constraints of like space. Um, but but what we were able to do because we we're working in VR was like kind of blow that hole up and make uh, like a super immersive giant environment. So these are some images of people at the gallery space. You can see it's very kind of dense and it's not that big, but it's like you know, beautiful forms and shapes and images on the wall. And there's some people in the headset um, experiencing the uh, kind of immersive experience. And so this is a shot of like what um, the inside of that world looks like. And to provide context for scale, this is like what the size of a person inside this environment would look like. And then if you zoom out, you can see that the world is like pretty large and very kind of spacious compared to the gallery space. And you zoom out even more and like the person is a tiny little dot, which you probably can't even see down on the surface there. And then one thing I wanted to do, so this is like, this is a bird's eye view of the whole kind of platform that the person sits on. And this is how the experience starts. They kind of start in this like floating space and then they go down into the, like the world. Um, and one thing I want to do because I'm a graphic designer and Wade and Leader are graphic designers was I had to include some kind of typography. So I made the kind of parameter of the space, the words of music to your eyes, these kind of giant forms. And then you can see the shadows that they're projecting around the space. And then this is like a full 360 view where you can see um, the text music to your eyes in the background. And so this, um, this kind of experiment in like kind of experience design was we found super successful. The audience, um, because the exhibition was in Japan, um, a lot of people were Japanese that went there. There was also a lot of foreigners, but there's a lot of Japanese people on there. The most common expression that 
we heard or that Wayne and Lena heard was sugoi, which is like, I, I don't know how to pronounce that exactly, but um, it kind of just means like, wow, in, J in Japanese. So we kind of achieved that objective, that very simple objective that we wanted to achieve, which is like, we just want to wow the audience. Um, and because of the success of that um, project, we decided that it would be cool if more people can experience it. So like maybe like a few hundred people experience it in the gallery. Um, technically I could share the, the 360 video. There's like maybe 10 million headsets out in the world and like maybe a fraction of those people might view the experience. But on Instagram, there's like 500 million um, daily active users. So we thought like if we did an AR version not like totally a version, but if we took the kind of aesthetic and playfulness of that exhibition and then we made um, an AR experience for Instagram, like that would be a way that we can make the experience way more accessible to like many more people and they can like use it in their own house. So we did this AR version um, and I'll show you, this is just a video of my son using uh, the face filter, which, which is in Instagram. So it's like very playful. It's accessible to everyone. Um, you can you can go on Instagram and search music to your eyes. I think no no no. It's called in, we call it inflated feelings on Instagram. So if you search for like face filters, um, if you search inflated feelings, you can try it out yourself. Um, and then in addition to that, um, Wade and Lita got asked to do a letter for 36 days of type, and so they wanted to continue this. Um, kind of experiment with this aesthetic and this this kind of way of making things. So they decided to do a world locked, not like a face filter, but a world locked um, letter W for 36 days of type and then um, post it on the 36 days of type Instagram feed. And again, it's a filter that anyone can use. So here's an example of in the middle. So on the left side, that's actually the guys from from 36 days of type using it. Um, in the middle, that's a shot of Lita in Brooklyn using it. And then on the right side, this is just some um, people, on, people on Instagram who we don't know who are like using the filter and tagging uh, Wade and Lita and myself. And that is, so that's that project. Thank you, Brian. Um, that looked like a lot of fun. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, it it actually goes to show how diverse, um, you know, this segment of design is and everybody yeah. had a different uh, type of project. So, um, so what, sorry, just, just one note that I want to add is that yeah. like, for as I mentioned, this is kind of a prelude to like the future of wayfinding. I, like all these, you know, Apple, Facebook, and, and Google are investing like billions of dollars into making AR the next computing platform. And they imagine that everyone like in seven to 10 years will be wearing AR glasses instead of phones. So it's conceivable that all wayfinding will be um, augmented reality at some point. Um, we're gonna hold you to that timeline there, Brian. <laughs> um, but for now, I'm gonna um, ask that we um, put the panelists up on screen. Um, and Abdul, if I can um, present the last screen as, um, viewers can ask questions. And um, one thing that I'll say is, uh, Rina, you speak Japanese. So apparently, Sugoi was pronounced correctly. Thank you oh, for cool. <laughs> confirming that. <laughs> um, so like I said, we're taking questions um, in the question panel on the side. Um, feel free to send that in the next couple of minutes. But um, I have some questions first. Um, and this is around certification. Um, I wanted to ask everybody, um, what kind of challenges did you face when you went through the certification process? And um, if you if you wanna share any of your challenges and stories and what uh, you can say to reassure other people who might be on the fence or thinking about doing it. I'm happy to jump in on that one. <clears throat> um, I was originally a little bit daunted by the, um, uh, I guess, well, so RGV, as everyone on this call 
at least on, on video right now knows, um, asks quite a lot of questions. They, they, they really want you to go through and they sort of like drag out the details from every project. And so, um, you know, it's like when, you know, you sit down and someone asks you sort of like the same question, but in five different ways. And, you can either get frustrated or you can like really dig deep and, and, and try and pull out, you know, what, um, what, what the product is really about. And so I really appreciated that process actually, because it forced me to go back. And, uh, although a lot of the projects I presented for my certification were relatively recent, there were some older ones like the one I presented today where I had to go back and think about the project and, and dig in and, um, and, ex and explain it. And it, it really, uh, it, it, I found that that benefited me actually as well. Cool. Um, Lindsay, do you have any stories you can share about your challenges and how you may have overcome them? Yeah, I think for me it was, um, I hadn't updated my portfolio in a long time. So this was a good way to me to force myself to update my portfolio. And again, it was, I mentioned it in my uh, presentation was, it kind of makes you organize all your thoughts and put it down on paper and organize it in a way that explains the process. Because as you're doing the project, you don't necessarily have everything laid out that way. So you kind of have to backtrack and go through what, why did you do certain things or, and then have it all down and in, in, in sort of a timeline format. So for me, it was just a great way to, yeah, organize everything and and then have my portfolio updated now. So, well, I think um, other designers who might be in the same boat as you could probably share that sentiment too. <laughs> yeah. um, Rena, I have a question for you. Um, especially coming with not having a traditional design education background, like what was valuable about the process for you? So it, I um, took. Quick clarification, my undergrad was in was a liberal arts degree, but I do have a graduate degree in exhibition design. But it was not it's not a fine arts. They just call it master fine arts. So it's a lot of combination of both like um academics and you know um liberal arts and and a little bit of design. But my I didn't take any typography classes or any sort of theory until maybe my third semester in just because i wanted to supplement all of the other sort of curatorial and um sort of experiential planning um classes we had um so that said the certification was really valuable to me because i you know i had just always kind of done graphic design and even my first um few jobs out of graduate school were you know exhibiting graphic designer as a title but I always had a little bit of an imposter syndrome about like not being a real graphic designer because of a lack of education or certification. Um, and we don't have anything like RGD in the US. So um, when I found it, I was really happy. <laughs> and and now that I have it, it feels um, it feels like I can really sort of say that I am an exhibit designer. I'm also a graphic designer at the same time. Well, Rena, we're so, glad to have you as an RGD member. <laughs> And representing Washington, D.C. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, Brian, um, you kind of mentioned this uh, at the end, but uh, do you have any specific tips or, um, you know, just things that might be helpful for other people that are in a similar design stream as you that is quite untraditional and um, unique and niche? Because um, we probably don't have a lot of uh, designers that kind of work in the VR AR space. So, do you have any tips or? I mean, I'm not sure for people. That... I don't know what kind of tips. I think like in terms of like for people who are in niche or kind of tangential disciplines. Like my career evolved a lot. Like I've changed a lot. And one of the challenges I had applying for RGD is so like a lot of my recent projects are like I don't know if they're really graphic design projects. Like I don't know, is this a graphic design project I just shared? I don't know, but um, but it's it just it speaks to like the kind of diversity and evolution of what graphic designers do. And I think that like continue. I think I would, um, you know, recommend that everyone try you know continues to kind of push the boundaries and redefine what it means to be a graphic designer and like what it means to produce design work. Yeah, I think um, I wasn't a reviewer, but I think there was some discussion about like, you know, how do we evaluate you? Because there were so few people that kind of work in your 
in your space, but uh, we're really glad to have you and hope that uh, you're going to be the pioneer of many that uh, <laughs> are going to be of, in this field. So, so we're at three o'clock. Um, I'm conscious of our time. and I really want to thank um, Rena, Brian, Ross, and Lindsay for being part of our series today and for sharing your diverse and outstanding work and the process that you want to go about it. And we hope that you've convinced some of our viewers to get certified at some point, or at least uh, give people insight as to how to put your projects together. So thank you, everybody. Um, our next certification info session for anybody who's interested in certification is Tuesday, June 15th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And our next certified, freshly certified webinar um, is tentatively scheduled for September 15th. So it's a couple months from now, but uh, check out your RGD calendar for other weekly webinars. And um, I'm gonna thank everybody again for, for being part of the panel and hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everybody.